Good afternoon from sunny Athens. Uh, we would like to thank Elf Economic Forum for hosting this very interesting panel, empowered by Yes Forum, the platform of open dialogue between young executive students and decision makers of the shipping community. I am Danae Bezandaku, I'm CEO of Navigator Shipping Consultants and concept, and concept founder of Yes Forum. And at this point, I would like to welcome our panelists uh, to the panel of how to create a sustainable new shipping era. I would like to welcome Yanis Dragnis, CEO of Golden Port Group, Alex Kajipateras, Executive Vice President of Business Development of Dorian LPG LTD, Christos Marcos, CEO of Interunity Management Corporation, Ioana Prokopiu, CEO of Sea Traders SA, and Yanis Martinos, owner and CEO of the Signal Group. Welcome all, and let's start our panel. And I will start uh, a question to Ioana. During COVID-19, many industries have stopped their operation, except for shipping, that even during these difficult days, continue to connect countries and continents, providing medical equipment, food, raw materials, and other products. Which difficulties you face? Because I believe that there have been also some difficulties that you faced. Firstly, I have to say what a pleasure it is to see uh, familiar and friendly faces even though it's online, we've been social distancing for so long, that it's very good to see people that uh, we know. Um, regarding the crisis that we're facing at the moment, um, shipping is no stranger to crisis. In the last hundred years, we've seen many, many crises occurring, and uh, this time is no exception. Um, still, maritime transport has remained, even today, facing this crisis today, the most efficient, reliable, safe and environmental friendly mode of transport. Um, as you said, indeed, many industries have stopped their operations, but shipping, even during these difficult days, has continued to connect countries and continents, providing medical equipment and food and uh, other products. I just want to put a little bit of a perspective into all of this. Um, as you may know, 90% of world trade is carried by ships. And in order to put this into perspective, to see the sizes we're talking about of those uh, ships, a single ship, a dry bulk ship, can carry enough grain to feed 4 million people for a month. In addition, uh, it can carry enough oil to hit an entire city for a year. So it puts a little bit into perspective the size of shipping. And given that 90% of the trade is done by sea. Um, moving on to difficulties we faced because of uh, COVID, um, as you know, there have been many restrictions um, regarding traveling. So, um, as, as uh, everyone has uh, seafarers on board that need to be repatriated, we are all having difficulty getting our, our men and women back to their families and providing relief for them to go on board. This is a, an issue that hasn't been normalized and we're hoping that this will uh, uh, be able to to, to uh, be resolved. I'll give an example for uh, the side of our company, for example. We've had two captains on board a ship for the last month and a half, close to two months now, that we haven't been able to relieve. So this is creating a lot of um, anxiety for the people on board and for the office staff that need to, to uh, that want to have the right people on board. Secondly, um, due to travel restrictions as well, we're having difficulty have, um, placing our superintendent engineers or our uh, superintendent operators on board the ships to be able to attend the vessels during necessary repairs or dry docks at shipyards. Also, from what I hear in the industry, a lot of people are having difficulty to um, provide provisions on board, necessary provisions like food or spare parts and uh, as well certificates uh, that the ships have on board and are expiring again we're having difficulty to renew because inspectors are reluctant to go on board either due to restrictions or due to fear and uh, finally another issue that we're having is that we have a lot of ships that have to stay idle outside ports in order to, for the normal uh, quarantine period to expire so we we are facing with a uh, 
um, extended, let's say, stays that are disrupting the normal trade of, of the ships? Yes, but uh, COVID, uh, we did not have any COVID-19 uh, 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 problems uh, on board. So the vessels uh, can be can, can be faced as as a secure way of uh, let's say of traveling. I mean, there were not problems on board, and this is very important. But the crew changes, yes, it was uh, one of the biggest problems that uh, shipping uh, faced. Um, I don't know if somebody else would like to say about any difficulties uh, raised uh, before going to. Um, or I will go to, to Yannis Dragnes, uh, to John Dragnes, uh, because 2020 would be a gold year for tourism and sea tourism. Uh, your family uh, is into this field and uh, uh, you see that everything has changed with COVID. Things are not going as uh, they were predicted. Cancellations have reached 90% in the commercial charter yachting sector in Greece. And uh, st some still hope that the months of July till September, uh, you know, will hold up the industry and uh, with support, of course, from the European market. Uh, many small and medium-sized companies uh, have fallen under pressure of recovering loan installments with no revenue. This is happening in many uh, tourist enterprises. <coughs> you are in this industry as we mentioned how you face all these difficulties arise from the COVID. thank you yes very interesting uh, welcome everyone you know when when we think about shipping and greece you know traditionally we don't think about about yachts i mean we usually we think about larger ships bulk carriers tankers and maybe sometimes when it comes to sea tourism people think about cruise ships however it is very interesting to consider yachting as well and its role especially within Europe, as our country and also other countries in Europe are a dominant force in, on a worldwide scale. Um, being, being more general, uh, tourism and travel is generally about 10% of the world GDP, uh, affecting 330 million lives as workers. Currently, the current pandemic is estimated that it has affected more than 100 million jobs and it's still, it's still ongoing. Now, as far as Europe is concerned, we contribute around 30% of that global GDP on that. Now, going specifically into yachting, where Greece has a competitive advantage and is a very important player in this market, uh, there, are, uh, there are around, let's say, about 5,000 yachts worldwide with regards to 20, 25 meters and upwards. The United States is the largest owner and uh, with around 20, 23% of the market, seconded by Russia, with 10%, Greece, it's a third in terms of ownership with 6.5%, and then by uh, UK, uh, uh, I think also uh, uh, Germany uh, and other European countries. Um, now, with as a business, yachting is contributes around $5 billion a year in terms of new building construction. So around $5 billion a year are being built with the gas of, of new yachts. And this creates, of course, very high value tonnage and high value jobs. 70% of that belongs to European uh, uh, countries and specifically to Germany, uh, Italy and the Netherlands. Uh, Spain and, uh, and is also uh, uh, somewhat of a player, but Greece, unfortunately, not so much yet. But I hope that in the future, we can play a more important role. As far as the global yacht charter market, that is even more interesting. As 2018, this market was valued at around 11 billion worldwide and is projected to reach around uh, $16 billion by uh, 2026, uh, registering an annual compound annual growth rate of around 6%. Now, Europe and specifically the Mediterranean is about 45% of that market. And this is just focused on a few countries, which Greece, Italy, Spain, Monaco, for example, France, and uh, uh, such countries uh, get uh, the whole market. Um, so obviously uh, it is a, an important industry and creates high value jobs and also brings in tourists which 
per tourist, the, the, uh, the uh, personal spend is very, very high. So actually, it's, it's uh, tourists that are well sought after. Now, this crisis, of course, has affected this industry as all tourist, tourism industries, uh, but not as bad as cruise ships, for example. Uh, it is true that you could argue there are about 90% cancellations, but so far we have seen that clients have, they, are, they want to come, they want to go on vacation, they want to be on a yacht because it is a safe, it is safe and it is a, uh, uh, let's say, a very, very nice way to be with your family and not be in contact with a huge number of people w uh, w while having a risk of contracting, for example, the, the pandemic. But it is quite challenging of how to get here how to get on board safely. So the airline protocol plays a very, very important part. You know, we've seen very good uh, uh, headway uh, with uh, the European Union Commission yesterday, where a protocol is trying to be established for travel, uh, which will be applicable from 15 June onwards for intra schengen countries. And we hope that protocol will be established to uh, third party countries as well. Um, and we hope that this again will, from the beginning of July, will, will increase uh, the market again. Our clients specifically want to come here. If they find a way, I think uh, Greece, uh, having controlled the virus very, very well, will be a very, very strong winner coming out of this thing. Uh, now to, it no, to, to con sorry. It will be very important uh, also from our side to, uh, to accept tourists in our uh, businesses, in any kind of tourism, in a safe way. So the yachts can bring them this safe way because they cannot uh, host too many people. Of course, of course. It's, uh, it's a few, few people uh, that actually actually join per, 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 per unit. Uh, now, you, you mentioned a little bit about uh, stressed companies and as everywhere, there, there will be stressed companies, stressed builders, uh, stressed own, owning companies and uh, all along the chain, because unfortunately, you know, we were living sort of a nirvana many, many years. We've had an amazing market for the last five years. So many people tend to forget the bad times. And now it all came crashing down in one summer. But I think uh, the companies with a, a, a conservative balance sheet and uh, let's say a, a more uh, a concrete model will not have a problem with one season. And I think uh, select tourism and boutique tourism like this will gain rather than lose uh, even as, as fast as even from next year because it is, uh, let's say, a more uh, more sustainable and a more, let's say, low. You don't get in contact with that many people. So I think in the short term... The crisis, cra crisis also bring uh, opportunities. So opportunity, it may be course, an sure. opportunity. And let's go now to the technology opportunity and to Yanis Martinos. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, forced the industry to turn more to digital tools and platforms in order to be able to monitor and handle business operations. From your experience, are shipping companies convinced, have been convinced that by using platforms through which technology can be exploited there and uh, uh, there will be maximization of efficiency and profitability, creating new opportunities and uh, prospects. How do you see this uh, uh, this opportunity for technology? Absolutely, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I guess we have all experienced in our personal lives how electronic platforms have actually helped us go through the crisis. If you look, for example, at the United States, yeah, the whole of the US, 300 million people practically depend on Amazon delivering essential items to them every day through the, the incredible network that Amazon has. Uh, we have all seen the, and experienced how it is to work remotely. Zoom has been one of the you know, darlings of, of um, the collaboration platforms. Uh, uh, also, Microsoft Teams is a piece of software that has been installed now in many of the shipping companies and has enabled a lot of us to work remotely. I'd like to think of how much we know, we all know that the economy has stalled to a, a very big degree, but I don't even want to think about how much it would have completely stalled if we didn't have these tools. So, uh, this is not 
specific to, to shipping, but I think uh, shipping has also learned from that. I see a lot of shipping people that only wanted to do face-to-face -face uh, discussions in the past and I would have to travel, let's say, to, to London uh, in order to meet them. Now are much more comfortable uh, and we can save also some uh, fuel and some carbon emissions by, by meeting up uh, electronically. Of course, there's no substitute for face-to-face uh, -face meetings as well, but maybe the ratio will uh, change, has already changed, and maybe this will last even after the COVID uh, problem has gone away. Also, more specifically to shipping, I think that uh, the, the shipping platform are become, have been many years that companies have been developing some of these platforms. And, and some of them are now starting to, to help owners earn more money and also help them to better manage uh, fuel efficiency. It also, they can also help us better understand how you uh, actually use the shipping network to transport commodities around the world and how efficient this network is to be able to track CO2 emissions uh, and see what you can do in order to reduce them. Uh, and also, it can, they can help uh, teams collaborate better over these platforms while uh, they're doing remote work. Um, we aspire uh, to, to be you know, part of the solution going forward. And we think that the positive experience that shipping has had with the use of electronic tools more broadly through collaboration will extend to uh, a greater appetite um, in the usage of uh, such platforms also for shipping specific. Great. So a, a, a big opportunity for the for the technology. Uh, I will go now to to, to Alex uh, Alex Kajipateras. Uh, your company uh, has offices all over the world. I mean, USA, UK, uh, Denmark, Greece. Uh, and uh, you have stated in previous discussions we had that uh, Greece's talent pool was one of the main factors that Dorian doubled down in Greece during, this, during the crisis and did not move to another country as many uh, uh, may uh, were thinking some years ago. Could you please share with us how uh, did you, uh, uh, how did you take this decision and uh, also uh, if you still believe that it was a good decision to be made during uh, the previous crisis? Thank you, Danai, and uh, I'm delighted to participate and I thank the Delphi Economic Forum. Um, indeed, during uh, 2014, uh, about uh, two years, we grew uh, the size of the office two times as we were expanding our fleet. And uh, the reason for that is we wanted to expand somewhere where shipping was embraced, embraced as part of the culture, but also where there was a technical uh, expertise. So uh, we've, we felt that for LPG, which is the, the gas side of the business that we operate in, that Greece was the right place to expand in. And indeed, uh, that uh, coincided with uh, myself spending more time here as well. Uh, since then, and since growing, we've continued to in invest here, most recently in uh, automation and, and remote maintenance, which tied quite um, luckily into, uh, let's say, what's happening now with people being able to travel to the vessel. So we've expanded our automation team uh, we have somebody from the office who is a PhD in uh, electrical engineering who's focusing entirely on, on how to, let's say, address fleet issues from his laptop in the computer, the laptop in the office. And um, we, we really believe that the market here is, is full of, of talented people. And also there are many ancillary services around the market in terms of, we discussed a little bit software, but uh, other technical companies. So. Uh, we think Greece's rich history has continued now into the future and um, still because relatively speaking the shipping industry although it goes through many cycles has rema remained uh, stable so we're, we're comfortable here growing on the technical side. Great so the decision continues to be the, the good one and uh, let's go now to Ioana again because uh, we are part of the European Union and uh, Greece 
uh, accounting for only 0.16% of world population and 0.26% of gross world product, has a dominating role in the global and European shipping industry. Greece is the major shipping nation within EU, having 17% of the global and 53% of total EU interest capacity. What does this mean for Greece and Europe's GDP? Indeed, Greece has the largest control fleet uh, and uh, it's uh, no, no secret that Greece is one of the, that Greek shipping is one of the key sectors of the Greek economy. Uh, contributing annually 13 billion to the uh, GDP and shipping account, shipping uh, uh, services account for 7% of the country's GDP. Uh, we are also um, employing 192 people both on shore and at sea. So Greek shipping is, um, is uh, one of the biggest uh, contributors of the Greek economy. But s similar stories with European ship owners as well because European ship owners operate one of the uh, largest, youngest, most innovative uh, fleets uh, with a very good uh, safety record in the world. So in order to put this in numbers, uh, European ship owners control 40% of the world's merchant fleet. And uh, even though they are European based, the majority of their trade activity is done outside of the EU. So if we look at the EU numbers, EU shipping industry contributes about 147 billion uh, euros to the annual uh, GDP. And as a whole, it provides uh, 2.3 million uh, jobs and estima estima estimated to produce 41 billion uh, in tax revenues. Also, we have to bear in mind that the average uh, income per worker per year is about 78,000 euros. So it's also a high paying industry. We, we can fully understand it and we're seeing it. And it's, uh, it's very important also to, uh, to be heard to, uh, to Europe and to hear these facts. Uh, now I will go to Christos and uh, I will uh, make you a question about oil. I mean, uh, except for uh, COVID-19, shipping industry and tankers also were affected positively by the crisis in oil market and the high freight rates that caused. I mean, we had uh, uh, some very big numbers to see, uh, which, was, which was very good during this uh, very unprecedented situation that we were facing. How long this will last? I'm sure you don't know exactly because if you can give this uh, info, uh, it will be great for many people. But uh, uh, just tell us a little bit about this uh, yeah. phenomenon. I think um, I think it's firstly important to uh, bifurcate the um, the dislocation that has occurred in the tanker market recently from the overall trend. Um, so. It, if we look at the impact of, of COVID and essentially what has happened here, uh, we have seen the largest slump in, in oil and, and product demand that we've seen in, in a long, long time. Um, it's almost 30% down. And if we look at the demand for product, it's essentially fallen around 20% in cities and 80% on motorways. Um, this is something uh, that the oil industry has been slow to respond to. So supply did not and still has not really caught up with this uh, slump in demand. We're still essentially pumping out between 96 and 98 million, uh, million barrels a day. Um, and all of this has created essentially a warehousing problem. Um, what do we do with all this oil? Um, and of course, you know, vessels are very efficient, very safe means of, um, of, of essentially storing, uh, storing the oil. And, and that's what's been going on. And it's been consuming essentially tonnage for that purpose. Um, what's also happened rather interestingly is as there's been a growing need of storage, there's been a growing need to also compress essentially the extent of the storage. And uh, what we've seen is that, you know, almost all of the Chinese refineries have come back online and refineries are essentially taking this crude product 
um, and you know delivering uh, you know de delivering product into the market that's not yet ready for consumption. So what we're seeing is that now the product market is also beginning to reap the benefits essentially of of this storage story. Um, however, we do have to frame this in, in, in you know how, how long is this going to last? Now, of course, I'm not even going to pretend to you know to, to try answer that question in any way accurately. I'll just you know share with you the tea leaves that that, that I see going on here. Uh, there are three ways of viewing uh, what's ha what's happened here in the world today. Um, there's the argument that this is a deep but short-term recession. There's the argument that this is a systemic crisis, and then there's the argument that it's just a shock. Now, it, all the data seems to evidence that we're talking about a deep but short-term recession that has essentially hit the services industry um, harder than, uh, than, than, than any other sector. Um, however, on the flip side, what we've seen is that governments have been very quickly to respond from a fiscal and a monetary perspective with robust policies, albeit that they may be lacking a little bit in clarity at this point in time. Um, but also we see that the service industry, yes, they are uh, very quick to fire, but they're also equally quick to hire. And so that's why uh, the expectation is that the rebound will essentially be um, rather more rapid than, uh, than, than the recession that we saw occurring about a decade ago. Um, this is to say that the expectation uh, is that this, this oil glut, this, uh, this consumption, uh, the, the warehousing problem will be absorbed. Um, but the, the big question is uh, when will mobilization, when will social mobility be restored? Because at this point in time, you know, the, the, there are some, let's say, terrifying stories of, okay, we start relaxing the measures and the expectation is, or the, rather the risk is that we, we come across a second wave. And, uh, you know, this is really the, the big question. Uh, when is it that we can, you know, we can restore essentially uh, our level to, you know, to, to, to the consumption that, that we saw pre-COVID? So this, this may be, you believe, uh, a, a problem for the second wave if, uh, if it comes. Um, I, I, yes, tell me, Chris. Well, I, yeah, I would say that uh, I, I would say that the argument of the second wave, you know, I can't I can't possibly comment. Uh, the science out there is is you know that's what's really going to be uh, essentially determining the outcome of this. Um, but it it would not appear that there has been really a, a systemic change in the oil markets. The world will continue, has, and always will have an insatiable appetite for energy. And that energy mm -hmm. is being fueled extremely cheaply right now. If you go down to the gas station, uh, you can you know, you know, can fill up your car more cheaply than, than ever before. And in fact, you're now being actively encouraged to. Um, and uh, really it is, uh, you know, it, and really it's, it's, it's when will governments and when will we have the confidence uh, in order to be able to restore essentially our former mobility um, to see that consumption rebound, that's that's the real that's the real question. So this gives me the opportunity to go to to Alex again because uh, Dorian is a liquefied petroleum gas shipping company and the leading owner and operator of modern, very large gas carriers, uh, the well known to us VLGS VLG. C C's. Sorry, but this is the CNS, it's not so great. Um, is investment in new technologies a wise decision? Uh, and where and will uh, this investment be an opportunity? Because Greeks, uh, Greek ship owners have always been very innovative, trying new kind of vessels. Uh, when uh, uh, they believed that it, they need to change uh, what was used uh, until that time that they were taking the decision. So, what do you have to say about this? Uh, um, you see that it is a wise decision. Thanks, Tanay. I think that um, 
specifically Greek Shabonans have a history of being uh, very smart, let's say market readers and uh, commercial risk takers, calculated risk takers. So uh, Greeks, especially last year, have um, stepped into gas, be it LNG and, and LPG, in terms of using that as maybe a stepping stone to future clean fuels. And I think uh, the financing that we see now and the sort of scoring system from banks in terms of how they rate your financing is also related to uh, overall emissions and uh, let's say the state of the fleet and, and how clean the ships are. So I believe that LPG and, and LNG are indeed um, stepping stone fuels. Uh, well, LNG has been used for a while, but LPG to the future as a way to reduce emissions. And um, we have, uh, as a company to date, invested in scrubbers, but for half of the fleet, and we're looking at LPG as a fuel for the future, mainly because of the retrofit cost. But I think uh, looking at new buildings, if we were to look at them, we would consider LPG fuel because it's a natural fit for a ship that's already carrying the gas and the technology has improved significantly. So um, I definitely uh, I do believe it's the right, let's say, investment for the future. Great. Uh, we can also start uh, replying some questions from the audience. And uh, I would like to ask uh, this question to John Dragnes. Uh, given the recent situation with the COVID-19 pandemic, do you believe that the inspection survey regime on board is subject to changes to reduce human contact? Have heard of examples in countries like Brazil before the pandemic where expeditors use drones for such activities? We cannot hear you. Okay, so I will do the next question to, uh, to John Martinos. No, we cannot hear you. So we go to John Martinos and then we continue with uh, Yanis uh, Dragnes, where do you think technology, this is a question for you, where do you think technology and specifically digitalization should focus next? It would seem that the current crisis is highlighting the need for crewing solutions. Do you agree with that? At the end of the question, the crewing union is more of a regulatory problem than a technology problem. Technology can be part of the solution in terms of the processes associated with, uh, let's say, getting group crews on board, uh, having the temperatures taken or technology for, uh, for testing for COVID idea and so on. But really, here we have seen a total failure from a, from a regulatory point of view. And yes, you know, obviously, uh, getting crews uh, on the ships and off the ships is, is really important. Uh, as to where technology should focus in the future, if we broadly break the two directions in terms of physical things like, uh, you know, fuel efficiency and maintenance and so on, I would say that, that there are some very interesting companies doing work in telemetry, uh, which is basically the, the process of, of uh, getting data from on board the ship regarding the onshore help uh, crews man better maintain and optimize the, the operation of the ships. So I would say telemetry is kind of like the, a very important area to work on. And if we discussed about the commercial shipping, I think there's a lot that can be done in improving our, our understanding of the markets. Uh, but uh, this is not, let's say, as, uh, as much of a straightforward problem that has been solved in other industries yet. Whereas telemetry is one of the problems that, uh, you know, has been in aviation for years, in Formula One for years, and there's a lot to learn from those industries uh, in, in how to implement it in shipping. Great. Um, Ioana, how important is it for shipping to remain in this part of the world, linking it with the up-and-coming regulations and legal tax framework? How this can drive shipping to other more favorable hubs? I think it's uh, to begin uh, the question, we have to understand the nature of shipping. Shipping is a truly international and truly mobile business. We have assets uh, floating in the high seas and as such, 
they can move anywhere in the world. The businesses are not tied with uh, factories and land-based structures. So it's very easy for uh, shipping to move to favorable environments. At the moment, what we see in, the, uh, in Europe and generally worldwide is that EU shipping is competing with uh, non-EU ship owners who often benefit from much lower cost structures and in many cases, their, their own uh, government gives them active support because they want to um, develop their maritime sector. So as such, we have seen a trend for EU shipping managers and operators to relocate in more favorable jurisdictions. Now, when looking uh, at Greece, um, I looked around to see what the tax burden across uh, traditional EU maritime nations was and open registries. So Greece at this point ranked with the highest tax burden when compared to Cyprus, Malta, the Netherlands, Germany, the UK, and some other open registries like Panama, Liberia, and the Marshall Islands. So this once more how there is an incentive uh, for even for Greek companies to for relocation to more uh, favorable jurisdiction. The problem of this though is that it, it would be a catastrophe for Europe from um, an economic, uh, political, and a strate strategic point of view if that was to happen. Because Europe is very much dependent on its ships uh, in order to have uh, security for its energy supplies. And this has been um, demonstrated over the uh, past oil crisis, as well as when we have neighbors who are having uh, tur geopolitical turbulences. We've always been able to rely on uh, on shipping for our energy or energy uh, needs. So, if the independent, the European independent fleet became extinct, it would mean that the majority of uh, trade by by sea would be naturally uh, left to China and other Far Eastern countries that enjoy a more um, favorable uh, environment. Let's say, but if that also happens, it uh, Europe would lose the wealth of the maritime knowledge, the skills and the heritage which is unique in the, in the world that we have at this point. And it's, it's a great shame because uh, as you know, shipping provides a cluster for educated people, lawyers, accountants, shipping professionals, and is also a high paying job. So if, if this knowledge is, uh, is lost, it's usually impossible to have it returned back to, to its original uh, country. So we desperately, as, as ship owners, European ship owners, we desperately need some stability over the longer term and a predictable legal and tax framework going forward. And uh, let's not forget that Greece is in the number three uh, of the worldwide uh, shipping trading uh, with Japan and China following, uh, not based on our own cargoes, because the other two countries are based on their own car of, on the cargoes for their countries. And also every voyage of a vessel, it may involve more than five, seven, or ten countries. So it's an international, uh, it's an international job, and uh, we have to do with many cultures every day, different mentalities, and this is something that we must learn from shipping because shipping, uh, shipping trading is ninety percent, as we said, of the worldwide trade. So we have to uh, learn from all of you that you are doing this uh, very important job. Uh, I will uh, go back to John Dragnis because now we are okay. Um, yeah, and okay. I don't know if you want to to say again the question. But about the, the surveys you asked before? About the survey, yes. Yes, uh, I was saying uh, one of the positive byproducts of, of uh, what's happening now is that there are more remote surveys on top uh, on, on vessels uh, by the classification society to vet the, uh, the condition and quality of a vessel. So basically, uh, it used to be the case, and it is the case more or less, that, that on every single uh, incident, the, the, the classification society has to send people physically on board and check certain uh, issues that have to do with that incident and the ship. So now we see more and more uh, uh, such surveys being, being uh, done remotely, and the classification society also promotes that very fact. Now, what is needed is the seamless cooperation between vessel, the crew, the people on the ship, the people from the office, and the people from the classification society for that to work better and better. So good exchange of information, good technology platforms to exchange that information, 
and a protocol that uh, clearly outlines the rules for uh, the, let's say, the customer, the ship, and the shipping company to pass the various uh, surveys. So, uh, so basically, I believe that this is positive. Now, although the class hasn't hasn't been able to do such surveys on even more critical components, say that have to do with the engine, engine room, or certain other critical issues, I think that by establishing protocol that uh, more and more such surveys can take place without the need of people actually flying over every single time, going on board the vessel and checking such issues. They can do that remotely with the feedback from the office and the crew of the ship. Okay, great. Uh, I would now like to go back to Christos and uh, ask uh, Greek ship owners were always, as we said before, very innovative and technologically advanced. However, the belief of the people was that Greek shipping does not like technology. Nowadays, we're experiencing, as we already discussed and with Yanis Martinez, a digital revolution. Transparency through increasing data gathering as the regulatory and environmental conditions the last has in particular dominated the European agenda. Could you please tell us what this revolution means for the industry? Yeah, of course. I think the first thing is that um, even Greek shipping has now recognized that essentially technology has been holding these economies together um, throughout the COVID crisis. And so it's beginning to embrace more and more you know, the, the, the importance. Um, uh, the, the the data, uh, the, the issue of data is actually a complex one. The first step is gathering the data. Uh, and the second part is making sure that it's accurate. And the third one is interpreting the data. Um, and at this point in time, we're becoming better and better at gathering data through the use of IoT on board of vessels. Um, and uh, the next step is essentially being able to have the necessary tools to interpret. Now, all of this, essentially, you, you have, you're solving essentially for a, pro, for, for, for a question, a problem. Why is it that we're gathering this data? Well, what is it that we're trying to do here? We're trying to create additional knowledge um, in order to be able to position ourselves. We're, uh, we're looking at it from a safety aspect so that we can essentially uh, uh, predetermine before incidents occur. Um, you know, these are the questions that essentially we're starting to ask ourselves, and we're making sure that the data is able to give us that outcome. And this is something that we have seen being ramped up in a massive way in, in shipping and it's, and it's being embraced because we have to appreciate that this is a very capital intensive industry. It's one where we entrust uh, very few mariners on board very expensive vessels. And in order to give them the, the absolute uh, maximum support, we have to be able to also give them the tools um, to be able to collect data and feed it back to us so that you know we can then in turn interpret it. I also think that we're seeing formation of fantastic um, data interpretation tools, essentially the ability to organize big data um, in order to actually make sense of it because uh, we're moving, and the dream essentially of, of of these data companies is to move away from an environment where we're processing and we can interpret what is going on board uh, into something that's more a more predictive model. And uh, that really is the you know the, that really is the dream. Whether it's you know safety related, whether it's commercially related, um, or yeah, it has, a, it has a lot of applications. Okay, let, let, let's see if uh, the, the dream uh, comes through. Sometimes uh, things are happening uh, earlier than what uh, we're planning of, and uh, this uh, happened with COVID. We saw many things changing in just one month. Yeah, yes, I, I think so. What I'd say is that COVID has actually, it's opened, it's opened a number of doors, which I believe will never be shut again. Uh, the first one is being able to work from home. Um, and that's an important one that, that a lot of employees are beginning to realize. And um, this is something that I think will be continued. The second thing is there were, there were a number of technologies that had been put to one side because there wasn't 
the immediate need to uh, to put them to effect to beta test them. Uh, one particular one, which uh, we work on ourselves as well, is the augmented reality uh, um, uh, on board vessels. Being able to essentially send someone on board with a panoramic uh, camera, and then from shore based, being able to wear VR goggles and uh, view what it is that the camera sees. Okay, now the camera can actually capture a lot more than uh, than any surveyor on board because it gives you the opportunity simply to pause, look around, and scrutinize the condition of the vessel. Now, this was primarily used, um, or in our experience, was primarily used by clients that wanted to carry out preconditioned surveys. Um, they figured that the cheapest way of getting the broadest possible spec before an SMP event um, was essentially to gather that. A superficial inspection conducted through a 3D camera and the use of, uh, of, of, of AR goggles uh, to, then, to then view the data and then annotate actually on the image. Um, it's very efficient. Now this is slowly starting to gain traction um, as, uh, as Yanni touched on as well with surveyors where they're beginning to recognize that these technological solutions uh, in fact do serve um, being able to circumvent class surveyors physically going on board vessels, possibly OKIMP surveyors. Um, and, you know, we're, we're beginning to see this, uh, you know, really traction in the industry. And then, of course, there's, I'm sure everyone on the panel has upgraded their bandwidth uh, and in their offices and in their homes and on board the vessels. And this was something that had been put to one side. Essentially, the main thrust behind increasing bandwidth on vessels was being able to give crew the necessary contact that they wanted with their families um, uh, ashore um, and bring that proximity. Now, the, the, the need for increased bandwidth uh, is, of course, uh, about being able to deliver this mass data and these images that, uh, that, that we require in short order. And so we're, I, I think we're really seeing an acceleration in, in, in that demand as well. Yes. and. Uh... We have to say uh, now that uh, shipping uh, is used to work remotely. I mean, I think that uh, we have been trained from before. We did not know what COVID, uh, but COVID proved to us that we can also work from uh, from home. And it all, it's also very important that uh, we're doing less traveling, and this may also reduce some costs that uh, uh, there were be people sent uh, in uh, on board just to check something for an hour. So the cost and the time lost uh, was uh, very important if he or she uh, would stay back to the office. So, and uh, before going to Alex for the top question for the young people, I don't know if uh, the audience is inspired because this panel is empowered by Young Executive Shipping Forum, but yes, forum, but before going to Alex, I would like, because after the comments of Christos is great for, uh, uh, Yanis Martinos to reply to the question about the virtual reality. How do you see growing the virtual reality features on the services and in the next five years? How fast would connectivity develop between SIP and SOAR for facilitating remote support and troubleshooting, emergency medical included? Thank you. Um... I think Christos touched a lot upon the, the subject uh, just now. Again, I, I, I'd like to draw some parallels from the shore before we, we get uh, to the ship, because basically the ship, the, the main difference that it has with respect to, to the shore is that it doesn't have the same bandwidth. Uh, so the internet connection on board the ship is not, let's say, usually as fast as it is uh, on land. And these applications first, are found on land and we have seen many efforts with augmented reality and virtual reality on land for you know inspections for uh, maintenance in order to de skill a little bit the maintenance work and have people guide uh, uh, workers through maintenance tasks but these have not yet been so effective so I think it will be really useful for reporting as Christoph said earlier but as far as um, it becoming like a, a really important part of the toolbox in the next five years, 
I think that it might take a bit longer than that. Um, but I, I think telemetry will provide more of the, the practical tools uh, in the immediate future, plus what Christo said about remote surveys uh, and so on, uh, th that will also help. Great. And now let's go to the top question to, to Alex, but also anyone else that uh, wants to reply can reply this question. What about young people? How challenging will it be for them to start their career in shipping industry during this situation? Is Greek shipping willing to help them? And if yes, what do you suggest us? Uh, they are asking, so Alex. Thanks, Tanai. Um, I think that young people historically have uh, traveled to Europe to study maybe their undergraduate studies, school, and uh, this crisis could result in people studying more uh, domestically. But many companies like ourselves have a link to, to schools to offer uh, scholarships, internships, training, um, to provide a practical, let's say, experience. So I think uh, getting experience on the vessels now, uh, we're seeing more uh, female cadets as well on vessels, expanding the, the pool. And then in line with the discussion on technology, another avenue may be um, to do data science, computer science, to get involved through, through that angle, which is super relevant and expanding and growing. And I think for young entrepreneurs that have ideas or, or maybe want to build businesses, there's more venture capital industry, uh, interest in the industry uh, around these technology companies. So I think the European Union has uh, will provide some funding for that. And it's a good opportunity for young people to read up about different startups in the industry. And shipping's historically been a laggard. So we're, like uh, Christus was saying, late to adopt many technologies. But uh, for all of those that were on the back burner, now we're embracing them, developing them, and I think that provides a wonderful opportunity for young people to get involved. So it will be a good opportunity to read more. Uh, there are plenty of webinars uh, that uh, are happening, and it's very important to take advantage of this time to get closer to the shipping industry and. Uh, uh, through articles and all these important uh, events. Is there anybody else who has uh, another suggestion or something to say about the young people? So we continue I, with... Yes, Yanis Martinos. I, yes. yes, I guess what I would like to add uh, to what Alex said is that maybe one thing that is changing with technology as well there is that for example, in, uh, when someone had to learn chartering, when I first joined the industry, it used to take three, you know, two to three years before they can start actually uh, fixing a ship, which is basically, you know, uh, giving out the ship for employment under contract. And that was a process that it took two or three years because you had to learn everything through osmosis. So you would sit next to an experienced person and uh, learn the ropes uh, day in day out and then that would get you to the point where you could actually uh, do something really useful for the company and i think if you have a digital tool that that can um, let's say help you understand some of the the necessary concepts much more quickly um so it's a little bit you know uh, the analogy of you know if you have access to uh, to Google right now, you can uh, you know you can answer some things much faster than you used to in the past. If you had the equivalent, let's say, of Google for shipping inside the shipping company, then you you would be able to to very much more quickly be able to contribute as a young person um, to the company. Hey, I don't know, Christo, if uh, you would like to add something. You said before. No, no, I think I think. Yeah, yeah, you know, you, you, Yanni put it very well. Uh, Yanni put it very well, actually. That uh, we have such unprecedented access now to information that it allows young people essentially to catch up in a much shorter space of time. What they lack for in experience, they can more than compensate for in in knowledge. And access to knowledge has become so immediate that um, they really do have a leg up now. Um, but I fully agree with with his comments. Great. So let's go to Ioana again and um, ask uh, 
there is uh, the European Green uh, Deal is a roadmap for making the EU's uh, economy sustainable. Taking into consideration that many regulations in shipping are institutionalized for the prevention of environment, what do you think that future holds uh, for the industry from this end? Okay, let's start again with the basics. Um, as you know, as we mentioned earlier, 90% of world trade is done by ships. And there is no dispute that the shipping is the most carbon efficient mode of transportation when you compare it to road or air transport. So international maritime shipping accounts for less than 3% of the annual greenhouse gas emissions. Um, now, when we are suggesting any measure for the sake of the environment, it is very important for it to be feasible, practical and sustainable and to be able to have clear environmental benefits. So if you're referring now to the uh, Europeans' proposal for the emission trading system, um, this is still uncertain. Basically, what, they are, uh, what the EU is trying to achieve is to place some sort of emissions trading scheme, which is basically a tax either on uh, fuel or on CO2 emissions for all ships that are operating either within Europe or that this ship, the, the trip starts in Europe and finishes somewhere else, or vice versa. Um, to begin with, it's very uh, positive that the EU has decided to take decisions for the environment. But um, as shipping is a truly global uh, business, it is preferable to have uh, global regulations under the IMO umbrella and not local legislation because this uh, often questions the authority of the industry's global regulator, which is still the IMO. Um, so including uh, shipping in the EU ETS can have many legal, technical, practical and political implications uh, for the EU. Uh, one thing that is important is to note that there is a chance that um, shipping to and from the EU will be reduced. Another thing that we need to consider is when we are suggesting some sort of a, uh, environmental uh, regulation, you might have a, a, a thing called carbon leakage, which is defined as an increase of emissions outside the EU because the EU actually take some climate, took some climate decisions for the, uh, within the European Union. Um, another thing that we need to mention is that there haven't been any tangible um, uh, researches or papers done on what they are expecting to gain from the emissions trading scheme. Like what what is what will the environment benefit apart from what the governments will benefit? Because uh, when you are taxing some something or somebody, firstly the uh, tax will go to the end user, so the end user will be burdened with the extra tax, and secondly you're gonna create a huge pot of money, and it raises questions on the management of the funds that will be collected. Who will use the money? How will it be spent? So um, I'm a little bit skeptical as to all of this. Uh, but also we need to mention that uh, it uh, goes without saying that ship owners have invested in the past and throughout the years a lot to protect the environment, both in terms of double hulls, ballast water treatment system, environmental uh, loop boils compliant fuels, etc. And the, we will always continue to, to um, act for the benefit of the environment, but we need some proven technology and some proven um, environmental results for us to go and uh, invest towards uh, that uh, route. Because it is a long-term process and uh, shipping up to now is not polluting the environment uh, like other ways of transportation. And until now, shipping tries to be very, uh, very environmental uh, friendly by following uh, several measures all these years, because we talk about uh, hundreds of years. Uh, John uh, Dragnis, there is a question about seafarers and passengers. Uh, and uh, I will make this to you because it's, it's good to reply to the questions. Uh, uh, do you think that seafarers can adapt easier than the passengers and apply the new health measures by utiliza, utilizing, sorry, utilizing their existing safety and security culture? 
this is this yep. is something well, that is a concern for many people now with uh, no, of course, of course. So it's very very that... relevant yeah there is a so many new rules that that we have to consider and follow right now but you know one has to create a framework for them and that is the job of of the shipping company and by extension it's uh, it's its agents which is the crew to set up a safe environment clear rules and uh, which uh, which people will understand that uh, the passengers will have to follow. There are protocols, especially in the cruise ship sector, that are actually, I mean, it's about time to that they should be addressed. For example, the air conditioning system on on on, uh, on cruise ships. That is a matter that has it has been the cause of of discussion and many illnesses for many many years that has not been been dealt with. You know, and this is the time to deal with that. For example, more filtering and more. You can't have one common air conditioning system that is. Who knows when it's clean? It should be an important item of how they are circulated in a cruise ship. The massive cruise ships actually have 5,000 people on board, so it is potentially a huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, source of of germs. Now, in our case, for example, in the smaller, obviously not a cruise ship, but small passenger yachts. I mean, we have very clear protocols that uh, that the crew has already uh, uh, in place. We've done that since early February. When we saw this thing happening in China, we thought that it would be an issue, uh, especially, of course, for people coming from Asia at the time. But now, you know, that's the least of our worry. Actually, we worry more about Westerners at, at the moment. And uh, there are protocols in place, whether it is about on board, about what if happens if someone, you know, is, is actually becomes sick. We even have, a, let's say, a private plane evacuation. You know, if, of course, that's in, in certain, certain extreme cases uh, for if someone catches the pandemic. But the bottom line, you either uh, uh, adapt or perish. You know, you have to follow the new rules, you have to follow the new reality, and uh, you move forward. You know, creating a safe environment, and at the moment is a little bit also psychological. Maybe we're overreacting in certain issues, like it was the case when it was first proposed yet, you know, to skip one one seat in in between passengers on an airplane. I mean, it doesn't offer any real hygienic protection, but you know, people felt that if I'm further away from the other person, then maybe I, I would less likely to catch illness. But, you know, certain protocols will need to beefed up to, and passengers will need to follow them. But we, it's our job to make it understandable and clear to them what they need to do. And I think most people, most people will follow. I don't see, I don't see a problem in the long term. Thank you very much. I would like to ask one question to Alex because uh, I want to do this question before making the closing, uh, very short closing remarks from all of you and uh, uh, one question from me. Alex, 2020 and 2021 would be challenging years for the uh, listed companies. Um, now also with COVID, what, uh, what will be the future? What do you believe? What do you predict? Thanks. Thanks, Tanai, for the question. Um, that's a very tough one. I think that uh, like a word uh, Yanni said about the psychology has impacted the markets. Uh, now I'm talking about the capital markets significantly. So you see tanker companies that are um, having very strong earnings in the freight market but their stock prices don't necessarily reflect that because investors are concerned about future demand, uh, sort of a big correction in uh, the economy. Uh, in terms of the one to two year picture, I still believe that there'll be a focus on um, clean energy, uh, medium to larger companies, um, perhaps also the technology element that, that we discussed. So I do believe there are still sources of capital out there, but uh, it will be more challenging for the small to medium sized companies, I believe, to sustain themselves going forward. Great. So I would like uh, your uh, closing remarks before closing this great uh, panel, uh, but also by saying if you believe that this historical crisis will bring Greeks closer and uh, bring Greeks to uh, cooperate uh, because of shipping the supply chain to empower our cooperations between each other and not only the shipping companies between each other but if you if you feel that uh, this crisis uh, will bring us uh, uh, closer in 
to cooperate for better days of our country. So I would like to start with uh, John Dragnes, as I see you, uh, about your closing remarks, and if you believe that. Yeah. Yes, well, Greek shipping and uh, Greece, uh, the dom domestic market, a little bit different. Uh, Greek shipping, of course, and shipping overall will, will continue and has done remarkably well given the extreme uh, situations that we're being uh, faced with, as was mentioned before in the panel, crewing being the top problem and showing the complete lack of coordination between between organizations in order to create uh, create a safe and uh, proper environment for us to be able to continue doing our jobs. As far as Greece is concerned, the, our lovely country, you know, obviously we have a head start. We've done extremely well uh, holding back the virus as, as some other Balkan countries as well. But the fact is that now, you know, the challenge is in, is in front of us. I think the bulk of it. And now we need to reopen the economy properly. We need to tackle the, the, the massive problems that this lockdown ha have caused to our country, the problem in tourism, and also to, to see how, uh, again, we will uh, uh, re-engage people and tackle unemployment, because there is no worse thing than unemployment. I wish more Greeks could go fast into shipping and on ships and in technology and what has been mentioned, but the fact remains that we have a large unemployment which may 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 go down after if if let's say the tourism industry opens but again it will remain and we we have a challenge ahead of us but i'm you know shipping shipping people are internal optimists so i will end on an optimistic note about my country and my industry you're very right alex i would like to um i think that greece has all the ingredients uh, to continue to flourish in the future as it pertains to shipping. I really want to echo Yanni's point about the seafarers. I think it's uh, critical that seafarers are recognized around the world as um, critical workers who can have free passage and uh, move through green lanes and airports and not be stranded because, as Joanna said, we shipping has gone through many crises in the past. And I think for the last few months, we've handled it relatively well. But for the longer term, and nobody knows what will happen, we really need to facilitate the movement of seafarers on and off vessels. So we've tried to do that until now by pickets where people could uh, disembark, but it's imperative that we're able to do that going forward, both for the crew mental welfare and also to keep the ships moving safely. But as far as Greece, uh, I think you know the ingredients are there. Greece has done a great job, knock on wood, managing the crisis so far. So a, a gradual, slow reopening should um, you know, provide some hope for the future. Thank you very much. Yanis Martinos? No, we will go to Christos. Ma ah, sorry, yes. Yanis, you can. Yes, yeah, yeah. So I guess uh, like uh, all of us here, I think I've been, I'm really proud with how shipping has managed to, to continue operating safely. Indeed, we, we kind of have a time bomb in our hands with the uh, seafarer situation, but I am optimistic it will be solved in, in time. And I also think that through this crisis, shipping has learned, has taken, let's say, its work um, habits to the next level because of the, of the new understanding and usage of tools. And I think this will be a good asset that we will carry forward with us after this crisis is over. Thank you, Thank you very much. Christos? Yeah, um, just to pay tribute, to, you know, to and the panelists and the Delphi team for actually uh, persevering and putting this together. And I think that's a testament to just how resilient um, we can really be uh, if we decide to be. And uh, that's also, you know, to echo what uh, what the other panelists have been saying. Uh, I think Greece has been particularly resilient, and the shipping markets um, uh, and Greek shipping has been very nimble and versatile and uh, and and well able to uh, to cope and overcome this we're seeing that uh, uh, greece is punching well above its weight and in terms of um its 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 uh, its involvement in shipping we can see that the s p transactions that are going on um they predominantly involve greek ship owners uh, somewhere down the chain even over the last few months um, and it's a real testament to uh how 
you know how organized and nimble we were and how we persevered to you know uh, to kind of get through this so i'm uh, also a perennial optimist cautiously so but uh, i am a perennial optimist and and i think you know we will find our our footing quite quite soon here um to uh, to recover nicely thank you very much and diana um Thanks, first of all, for the lovely panel and the opportunity to discuss all of these uh, issues. I think what this uh, crisis has brought forward in terms of uh, Greece, I want I want to talk about, is the fact that we have been able as Greeks to be very law abiding and to follow all the regulations that we were um, and all the suggestions that we we had to do. So it was a completely different image than I think the rest of the world has for Greece, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to continue such behaviors that are positive and that have kept us safe as well. And the other thing I want to point out is that there's been a tremendous solidarity um, and within the shipping sector and generally people that were able to, um, to contribute to uh, hospitals, to people in need, to so many institutions that made, um, made requests for um, goods and uh, and help have been uh, have been um, people listen to it and they, they 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 were able to find um essential material that they needed and i think in in some ways this has brought this has brought a better version of greece and of greeks so uh in a way i'm thankful for that a big thank you to all of you and for delphi economic forum of bringing us close, virtually close, and let's hope that next year we will again meet uh, in beautiful Delphi. Thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you.